Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are artist Carlos Betancourt and actress, author Alexandra Leiden. Artist Carlos Betancourt was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico. His work is in the collection of many museums across the U.S namely the Metropolitan in New York, the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., uh, the Miami Art Museum, and he's received a National Endowment for the Arts Award and another great thing, the Florida Cultural Recognition Award. So, Carlos's work has been exhibited in galleries and at art fairs throughout America. We're so happy to have him with us because he lives in Miami where he's the co-founder of 801 Projects. What is that about, <laughs> Carlos? <laughs> Thank you for having me on your, on your uh, profile, John. Uh, 801 Projects is a, it's a center for uh, um, artists, young artists, uh, that helps uh, promote uh, uh, their work, give them studio space in Miami, and actually um, motivates them to sort of like take their career into their, hand, into their own hands. And, um, and put their own exhibits together. Oh, it's a whole motivational thing? It's a whole teaching thing? In, it's, it's more, it, uh, it's, I think it concentrates more in freedom or letting the artists really like find their way. <coughs> and that was initially the, the direction of the, of, the, of the mission of the project, and that's the way it's gone. It's, it's pretty how, good. How do you decide on what artists to let come in? Do they audition? Uh, yes, we actually you in, do. Yeah, initially we had a panel, uh, and we would look at their portfolios and work. And now it has sort of like a life of its own. I really don't even visit much that often because it, you know, it it allows them to take responsibility. Uh, did you for the start? Themselves. Did you start in something like that? Is that why you were interested in I, s I, starting? I did. It? I did. Uh, when I w when I left art school, I actually. Uh, worked in the art center. It was part of a program in the art center in uh, in Miami Beach. Did you go to art while. school in Miami? Yeah, I did in Florida, and the art center was very supportive of of, uh, of, of my career as a young artist. And, uh, oh, so they followed you and helped you, and you're oh, yes. putting doing the same thing back. Yes, yes. So, you know, trying to you know, the, the, also the, the the collectors were very good to me when I was young. That's what I try to do to also uh, to, uh, to introduce them. Introduce them, and I, I myself with uh, with uh, with other friends, we sort of like engage other people to start collecting art. I ah. myself collect a lot of art of uh, of uh, uh, local artists as well as international artists. So you know, it's tr trying to look, you know giving back for those for that experience that I had that that allowed me to grow as an artist. You know. That's repeating fantastic. Repeating the formula almost. Actually, well, that's great so, talking about repeating the formula because that's what what people need. When you left Puerto Rico in 1981, mm -hmm. when you came to Miami, what were your intentions? Were you going to be an artist? Had you gone to art school already? No, I actually, I think all the arts were that, that all the arts interest me. I, I really started pursuing architecture first. Uh, that's what we were talking about uh -huh. with someone the other day. And, um, um, and I'm still a, a lover of architecture. I think it's the first thing when I go into a city is look for like uh, you know, architectural significant buildings. It's ingrained in me. Exactly. And my work is, is, is also very architectural. I work with Alberto La Torre in many collaborations in, in, in uh, uh, public art projects or big commission. And, and I think I express myself through him too uh, when we do these uh, monumental uh, uh, projects. But um, I know it was art all the time. It's it was always for art. Yeah. You talked about collaborating with Alberto. 
um, you did this project, a, a public art, is it, with no, purple? What it, is that it piece? It's actually my last uh, a solo exhibit during uh, Art Basel in Miami Oh, was Beach. it Art Basel? We yes. did, uh, so yeah. tell us about that project. It's um, um, 16 uh, sculptures. Um, in a quite spectacular blue, one of those Eve Klein's blue kind of like I shades. It, it worked with the red background. Fantastic the, the, colors. Uh, <laughs> and the you. way they were installed. I'm a big believer in color. Uh, I believe in color profoundly, like I believe in nature. But that, that uh, collaboration with Alberto, um, it was about glorifying this, the, 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 the common object. My, my work deals a lot with memory, with uh, vintage items, uh, uh, how, how it's, it's, it's an effort our, almost to, to, to play on the idea of the things that we record in our brain, uh, giving, giving objects, uh, uh, establishing the memory that they have on us. And in that project, we sort of like glorify these things from the siren and chair. To, yeah, and, uh, and the heads, what were the? The, the um, uh, skull heads, uh, deer heads, things that are, that, that are meaningful to my journey that I, I have a memory of. No, we played a lot with the with with the uh, this this thing about cage objects that you just can't get ah, off your I head, see, and I that see. is sort of it's like a pantheon of deities that we made off these objects, and uh, it was quite you know thank God a very successful idea. I I, I enjoy it. It's it disassembled right now, but it, it's disassembled. <laughs> well, could it go? So could it be installed somewhere? Hopefully, else? hopefully that's why we're working with my dealers and, and a couple of museums and uh, see if we. Uh, uh, assemble it again soon. So we, you're, you're talking about kitsch and vintage and memories. What uh, Describe the materials you use to put together these things. See, we, like this piece. Okay, uh, I don't, that piece is called a Recollections. And again, the name Recollection, you know, it's a der derivation, it, it derives from the idea of memory, no? Uh -huh. Recollecting these objects, collecting right. these things that are meaningful to us. As we pass through life, that's that's a you can call that almost a photographic collage, and it involves close to in that one in particular like three four hundred images. So do you take use a photograph? A yes. uh, you use photographs, but do I, you take them? Yes, yes. Uh, pho photography is a big part of, of my expression as an artist. I do work in three dimensional, you know, with sculpture as well, a performance, but a lot of it is photography. And uh, did you ever think of being a filmmaker? Of course, of course. I've done my, uh, <laughs> or an actor. <laughs> <very late. laughs> uh, I don't know about acting. I, I, I you know, I, I do it through my work, of course. Uh, um, I, but I, through I, your person. I play, uh, <laughs> I, I play a lot of uh, roles in my in my yeah. performances. Yeah, it's all it's all it's all connected. I, I I like producing. I like producing like I do my 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 big uh, artworks. What would the background of this be? You've used photographs, but what would the background? Paper, canvas. Uh, that one is is digital. That one uh, the, on the Last Supper is is actually a backdrop. No, the other oh. image of a. Uh, on the uh, it's a, 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 a let's know, talk about this. Oh, this is a background. Yeah. And you put the people, these are all live? Exactly. Those all characters, it's, it's around 20 something. I can't remember how many characters. You get all there these are. people there at the same time? It was a production. It, was a production. it is a production. Two months and then one day of <laughs> photographing. And again, playing with all these items and bringing all these items that, are, that have a memory or I'm attached to. Uh, there's a lot of the items that belong to my grandmother when she passed oh, away. Oh, they were. You know, every time I see them again, they, they, they were important to her. They were significant to her. So I incorporate that in, in, in the work of my, of my, uh, of my work a lot. You and, know, then, and then how d does this go? Is this reproduced on a large yeah, that's scale? reproduced in a, that was reproduced uh, in 20, 30 feet uh, uh, vinyl print. Ah. And then there was editions of that print uh, as well. I see. Th um, so th those, are, I'm trying to get to what you sell or exactly. you just do installations or what? No, no. I would say that, that what, uh, I, I usually do one grand piece that uh, uh, lucky for me ends up in a museum or you know, in a collection, private hands. And then there's these editions, smaller editions. That's what of, I wonder. Of, uh, and stuff. this, I think you were talking about your grandmother. Now we can talk about uh, your parents. your parents. Yeah, they're, they're significant in my artwork. They, uh, and tell us their names. My mother is Teresa and my father is Enrique. And, that and the, the last name, because I didn't Betancourt. say it right. 
Betancourt. No, you said it different. Betancourt. That's Betancourt, right. correct. Betancourt, you're right. Enrique Be Betancourt. Enrique Betancourt. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. So, these are your icons. <laughs> these, these are, are your icons. icons. <laughs> these are my kids' icons. And again, memory. I took them. This, this photo in particular, I, I, this is a place my parents took me when I was a, a little kid for many years in, in a house that they used to rent. Uh, in the coast of Puerto Rico, in Rincon, and then as I grew up as an adult, I could never get that house out of my, my head. Ah. And, and I rented it 25 years later, and I took my parents. Oh, how cute. <laughs> already as a grown up, and, and, and I photographed them with all these uh, iconic things. That actually, a lot of like uh, um, uh, references to Western African culture and many cultures is what's in there, because you know, my, my, I'm, I'm very much influenced by, by that as You've well. done a lot of uh, public art pieces. Yes. And how do you find that, that these commissions? You have to um, talk to the public, you have to talk to the people in the buildings. Do you do all of that ahead of time? Yes, I, I, when you work with public art, it's as difficult. Well, it's, it's different. Uh, you do compromise. And, and you have these conversations with a lot of people, and, and hopefully you 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 reach a place that you, you're not uh, uh, that you your expression, your natural expression of what you want to do, is not a compromise to a degree that you don't want to execute it. But I I mean there are great challenge great challenges. Uh, uh, I I simply follow the career of great artists, you know that have done public art. Most most artists have been able to uh, pull it through and I'm very lucky and so fortunate to do them and collaborating with Alberto as an architect gives us a lot of Oh, Alberto is an architect mm -hmm. besides, so he has that. I want to show you something else that he collaborated with, with you, because I think this is absolutely Thank you fantastic. So Look right. at it. Talk about Thanks. all the icons. This is one of, 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 of the, the recent works I worked on. And, uh, it's, it's natural uh, that it should have been, you know, a scarf. And artists, you know, through through the history, have worked with objects, you know, and uh, and and products. And of course, I'm I, I'm immersed in it as well, you know. <laughs> this is a beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank silk. you, Lyon. It's from Produce, Lyon. Yes. Oh. One of the, the and do they old, uh, silk screen it there? How yes, do they do it's it? all produced there. It's uh, it's, it's 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 just a spectacular material and. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, the it's factory is very, very, very old and has a great history and, and uh, we went for Did it. Did the I, two I, of you stay there for a while? No, we didn't, unfortunately, but we will in the very near future. How did you get it done and, then? Was, was did Alberto stay there and, and watch and the production? Alberto did, and, Alber and then, of course, you can do a lot of things nowadays, long oh. distance, to continue <laughs> the product. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to get the colors right uh, to do the yeah, things that we want. Yeah, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're just about out of time. I wanted to show the, the cover of this catalog as well. And tell us just this figure. Tell us about uh, this. That is my bot. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> this is actually part of, a, a, of an installation of around 6,000 sand castles. If you fold the book oh, like that. I'm going to open it like that. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, there is we that go. It? Thank you. You open it right Perfect. there. Perfect. And this was a performance and an installation simultaneously that I, I I built around 6,000 sand castles in a pretty much a monumental oh, warehouse. These like are a, a all cathedral. sand castles? Can ca sand castles. And this is you? And that's me. Then I built them. They were there for Art Basel in, uh, in Miami, uh, a part of the Art Fair events. And uh, um, then I did a performance actually walking around all of them and destroying them. Again, attached to exploring the idea of memory and were and you being naked a were you naked uh, partially yes yes partially yes. You did know, you draw a big on it <laughs> <laughs> when i do my performances <laughs> they're more private than, oh, i see i see well will you yeah. invite us to a private performance of course john long time ago yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you carlos no, thank you i'm so happy he was here from miami today so he could be with us and don't go away we'll be right back with alexandra Leiden. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with actress, author, director, and producer, Alexandra Leiden, who was born and raised in Massachusetts. She graduated from NYU 
with a degree in psychology and drama and immediately started acting on stage, film, and TV. How did you do that? <laughs> well, um, I just started auditioning. Um, from from the NYU? Moment, yeah, from the moment, um, actually, uh, starting leading up the month before graduation. Really? I really started getting out there and submitting myself for whatever I could and having some faith. <laughs> did you have, were you, did you really feel confident? Because it must be very difficult to like go on auditions. You're in New York. You know, it, it is difficult, I think, because um, in training programs and in college, they don't really teach you about that. I know. Why don't they have a class in that? You know, I, NYU had one class, and I, and I took it, thank God, because it did teach me a lot, but not as much. I mean, you spend, you know, four years in a conservatory training, which is fantastic, um, and you need that training, and then you get, like, one class. <laughs> it's like, this is... Go out this and get is, a job. <laughs> exactly. This is how you work, we think. But it, it's also, I think, because there's not really a science to it. There are tips that people can give you, but yeah. it's, so, it's such an individual journey. And did everyone. people did people give you tips? They did. They did. Um, that one class I took <laughs> one time was helpful. Um, but, uh, and I, I did get some tips, but really what it was was just learning through experience. And that's why I'm... You mean going and then going, seeing why you're rejected or why going, you're accepted. failing, walking out and saying, I will never do that again. <laughs> Is it true? Do you really do that? Yeah. Oh, it must be horrible. Yeah, I, I had a lot of those experiences. Um, so okay. psychology came in. Yeah. That was helpful. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I could analyze the person sitting across from me. No, I you could analyze, analyze myself. yourself. You couldn't no, do that. That's oh. dangerous. <laughs> did, you, did you wait tables in between? I did. I did. I was, um, I was a cocktail waitress for many years. Um, I worked in nightclubs in uh, all over New York City. And I, even when I moved out to L.A., I was waitressing for a few months um, to try to get some income. Well, talking about moving to L.A., why did you move to L.A. when you had such a good cocktail waitress yes, job no, in New York? It's hard to pass up, Joan. <laughs> it's really hard. Well, um, a couple things happened, actually. I was in New York. Uh, I graduated from NYU. Um, I lived there for two years. And um, September 11th happened, oh. um, which was, um, it happened right after I graduated. And, you know, it was, it it changed obviously for many New Yorkers. It was it was a, a big traumatic event, and um, it kind of it sparked the interest in me to go somewhere different to get it to have to a get change. Out of it, but yeah. you know, I, it wasn't that alone. Um, but that kind of started a chain reaction of a few things for me happening when it came to New York. And I went to Mexico. A friend of mine oh. lived in Mexico and worked in Mexico on an ashram. And I went there for um, a while and lived and worked there. Did you teach there? Yes. Yeah. And um, and I worked with children there. And the experience of being there was fantastic. Oh. And on my way home to New York, I stopped off in L.A. For that was it. A weekend, <laughs> just to just to see it because I'd never seen L.A. And I was there for a weekend. I was in Santa Monica. I was on the ocean, and something just hit me. I said, you know what? Let's try it out. <laughs> and I went back to New York, packed up my bags. And oh, you did? was on a plane. So you came without an agent. Did right. you find an agent? I did. Was, I it, did. was that easy or hard? Um, by the grace of God, I've met with an agent, and they signed me. Um, the first agent I met with. That Is that was right? By the grace of How does that God. happen? Do they talk to you because you've been on Broadway or because you've acted before? How do they know mm -hmm. to take you? Um, you know, I actually have never been on Broadway. I've been on off Broadway. Off Broadway, and I meant. Off, off Excuse Broadway. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, just want to give myself a credit I don't have. <laughs> I'd love to be on Broadway. Um, but uh, I um, no, it just I had a reel of some things that I had done. Oh, you did. And a lot of actors will try to get reels together, and you just kind of meet with people, and they have to kind of take a leap of faith with and, you and if have they you. Like you. And like the personality, and there's yeah, a yeah. If there's like a good match. So you had recurring roles on Twenty Four and CSI and Prison Break, and mm -hmm. yes. So that was yeah. good. So did that it start was. right away for you? Um, Twenty Four was the first job that I did when I moved out here. It was after being here for a couple months. Oh, and so that was great. It was so it was so wonderful because they are an amazing. They were the shows now off the air, but um, they were amazing cast and. 
And Karuna was a great first job to have. <laughs> and then you Amazing. had guest appearances on a lot of different shows? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, like House, CSI, uh, NCIS, those kind of... Desperate Housewives. Desperate Housewives, yeah. 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 And, and um, you continue to act? Yes. But you yes. got this idea for worst laid <laughs> plans. <laughs> Uh -huh. When did that come in? <laughs> that beauty. Um, that yeah, where did the idea come from? The idea came from um, a friend of mine, the co-editor and co-creator, creator, um, Laura, and I were in, uh, we went on a trip to Ireland together. Oh, right. I Laura Kindred. Yes. Okay. So Laura you were Kindred. going to Ireland to do what? To, to work out some family stuff there and to have oh. a little vacation. It's supposed to be just a two-week you know, getaway, relaxing trip. Yeah. Uh, so Laura came along with me, and one night um, we were both extremely intoxicated. Uh, she went back to the hotel room, and I had an encounter with the man that we now refer to as the farting rapist. <laughs> and he is in the book. <laughs> so, so you've written one of your stories. One of the stories is yours yes, in the yeah, book. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that was just the idea. Let's right. write, let's do what? Let's write about this guy that well, almost raped me? The, <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were that simple, Joe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, um, the next morning, uh, I, we were both in a really bad place. And just to kind of lighten the mood, we both started telling each other stories of our worst sexual experiences um, and making each other laugh. And it just, for some reason, continued and continued. And the next night, when we were drunk again, uh, coming home from a pub, uh, we um, had the idea of, wait a second, this could be a show. And not only could it be a show, I can't believe this that. Could it's be so much more. It's and so it funny a, that that's how the genesis would be. Yeah, yeah. And this yeah. could be a show. And you mm -hmm. did make a show. You didn't do a book first, did you? No, we came back from Ireland and we approached friends that we knew that were comedians, performers, and amazingly talented. And we all got together. <laughs> and kind of workshop these monologues and came up with the structure of the show, which was originally going to be a spoof on the vagina monologues kind of thing. <coughs> oh, right. Like, the so like sitting at table. Yeah, and you know, like the spotlight, one person <coughs> on the stage. And, um, and we did that for a while, and that it did well. So we just How many people it. did you have doing the show? We had seven originally. So they were all sitting at the same time? Um, or did you? Seven people. Uh, there'd be one person on a stool in the front with a spotlight on them, and then the other six people in the back in chairs. Um, but there were seven watching. on stage. Yes. And, yeah. the, and they shifted back and mm -hmm. forth? Yeah, we'd have the passing of the um, <laughs> baton, so to speak. <laughs> and then did they all tell their worst sexual experience? Yes. Is that what it was? So mm -hmm. was it written? It was. We would, um, anytime we would have a guest come on or somebody oh, yeah, did new, you? Yeah. because we would rotate um, people and we'd have celebrity guests come in, they would submit to us kind of the rough draft of what their story is. I and see. then we'd workshop it into, you know, a, a concise monologue. I see. Well, did the other people workshop it with you? Or was it just the two, Laura and you? Originally, it was everybody workshopping it together, that original seven people. And then as it progressed and guests would come in, were you limiting them us. on time? Or yes. Oh, you yes. were? Some of these people would go on forever, <laughs> so, including myself. I could be up there forever. Um, so, so you gave them a time limit? We did, yeah. It was between um, like five and six minutes. Per I monologue. see. Yeah. And were, did they all use their real names? In the show, yes. In the book, no. <laughs> okay. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about that because in the show they were standing there in front of you and they had to use their names, right? In the book you're reading it. Yes. Yeah. And there's a difference, I think, to performing something so personal, like on a stage one night. You know, it, you can deny that you ever did that, but <laughs> you can't deny when your name is on a story in a book. So and it's um and it's, anyway, printed. It's, it's, it's printed. It's <laughs> printed forever. So tell us. The, okay. So. We have these people on stage. Some are comedians, some are actresses. Are there actors? Are there men involved? Yes. We started to get men involved after about six months or so of doing the show, and we would have all male shows. Oh, you did? Um, we had one in particular, um, and it was called uh, Worst Laid Mans. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they told their stories? They did, yeah. And in the actual, in the original <coughs> show and in the ongoing show, we have one man at the end, uh, Matt McConkie, who we call the token homosexual of the group, um, who performs like a cabaret number. So he would be up there. So he'd finish off well. the mm -hmm. thing. He'd well, see everybody out. So, so did you just take these monologists 
and write them down or how did you decide to put them in a book what at what point did you say oh this is can be a book you weren't back in ireland drunk again no you were <laughs> thank god <laughs> <laughs> no um, no uh you know it was something that kind of gradually it was an idea that gradually progressed and just kept kind of tugging at us, I think. The more, it's got to be put yeah, down. Yeah, the it's more gotta... stories that came in and the more um, people got involved, the more people I spoke to, it just was always this little voice in the back of my head saying, you know, this could be a book, this could be a book. So how, how, how many contributors did you have to the book then? We have 38. And how did you decide? Because you must have done a lot of shows of seven people, mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which adds yeah. up to more than thirty-eight, right? Yeah. No, we had we had a lot of stories and um, and a lot of uh, willing contributors, which was fantastic. And um, it was tough. It was a tough choice, but and we wanted to get something as diverse as possible. So, so you so you did sexy stories, sad mm -hmm. stories, gross stories, mm -hmm. right? Shameful stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there were all different um, kinds, and we have all different kind of people from all different voices. That's you had Lorraine Newman's story. Yes. Tell us a little bit, because yeah. she's probably one of the best-known people in yes. the book, or yeah. well-known people in yeah. the book. Yeah, Lorraine Newman, who's the original um, Saturday Night Live uh, cast member, she uh, submitted a story about a man that she dated back in New York where she accidentally... Um, herself <laughs> while, while at dinner with him or while they were having dinner and I uh, hope they were laughing <laughs> and if she didn't know how to tell him that that's what happened and she was just like sitting there and she knew she had to clean up things it was like coming onto the floor and so all she could think to say was I have voided myself <laughs> and the guy is like what? Like he, he he thought that she was saying that she, she didn't have anything um, left to say because he was just so witty. Um, I'm void. <laughs> exactly. I, I have no response. And the funniest part of the story, which uh, is kind of the same for a lot of the stories, is the her trying to clean mm. up and not have them see, or her trying to back. Is that like part of every most of the stories? Yeah, it's that it's there's there's moments in all these stories of how can I fix this without, you know, too much pain. <laughs> like, That's very like, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's about trying to get yourself out of the situation you got into, but usually it just gets worse <laughs> as you're trying to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I think the gross stories were gross, really gross. Yeah. Sorry, and, no, um, <laughs> and the sad stories were really sad. Yeah. You know, people tell sad stories about themselves. And it's a wonderful book to carry around with you because you can read one story at a time mm -hmm. and then just, you know, carry on. Would I have done that or how would I have done right. it? Yeah. So we're back to the psychology of it all. Yes. <laughs> Well, Good thing you took a psychology <laughs> class. <laughs> yeah. Um, it rarely comes in handy. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think it, it's something that a lot of people can relate to. I think everyone right. can relate to making mistakes in their lives. And I think when it comes to sex and something that personal, <laughs> when a mistake is made, it's almost more traumatic. Because <laughs> it's that, um, you know, it just touches upon something that personal. And there's also, for the contributors and for myself, there was something really healing. Oh, that's interesting. For the contributors to get Absolutely. it out. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Whether it's performing or writing it, um, there was, it's cathartic to great. Kind of put it out there unapologetically. And, yeah. yeah, that's great. And thank you for being with us thank today. You. Thank Thanks you. for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing uh, to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And email me, as you have been doing, J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N -N at AOL.com. See you next time.